Hi class, this is Dr. Shahada, and in this video, I will be going over chapter 13 on health policy. So in this week's module, you are provided with PowerPoint presentation, which I'll be covering a number of the slides in the presentation in this video, as well as a file that lists the terms from the chapter, as well as the definition. All right, so let's get started. I am actually going to jump from this page from this week's module to the PowerPoint presentation for chapter 13. All right, so here we are at, in the PowerPoint presentation for health policy, and I am going to jump to slide number three. So public po policies are authoritative decisions made in the legislative executive, or judicial branches of government. They're intended to direct or influence the actions, behaviors, or decisions of others. Now, for health policy, it can be defined as the aggregate of principles, stated or unstated, that characterize the distribution of resources, services, and political influences that impact on the health of the population. So there are two primary uses for health policies. The first one as a regulatory tool. So health policies often serve a regulatory purpose. An example of this would be drug safety, air pollution control, licensure and certification of facilities. The second use is allocative tools, meaning used to allocate resources. All right, so in the next slide, it explains how the policy can also be used, again, as allocative tools, involve direct provision of income, services, or goods to certain groups of individuals or institutions. So it's distributive or redistributive policies. So the two main types of allocative tools, we have distributive policies, which spread benefits through a society. An example of this would be funding of medical research, development of medical personnel. So here, funding of medical research through NIH would be an example as well. Redistributive policies actually take money or power from one group and give it to another. For example, use of tax funds to benefit a certain category of people, the poor, the elderly, or children. So it creates visible beneficiaries and payers. Example would be Medicaid. Taxes come from more affluent groups and spend on the poor, as well as CHIP, welfare, and public, public housing programs. Now, health policies, first, they are a byproduct of social policy. So, for example, Family Independence Act extends health benefits to welfare recipients once they obtain employment. They're also a byproduct of other public policies. An example of this would be policies supporting biomedical research. Health policies affecting specific categories of individuals, such as physicians, the elderly, or children and that I should have been on the following slide. And health policies affecting certain types of organizations, such as hospitals, nursing homes, or employers. And health policies are also sometimes created to preempt public policies. For example, the pharmaceutical industry may voluntarily to decide to restrict price increases in order to avoid price control legislation. 
So on the following slide, here are public health policies, which include reforms in medical education, 1965 enactment of Medicare and Medicaid, federal funding for family planning clinics, a merger of two hospitals violates antitrust laws, procedures for licensing physicians, monitoring sanitation standards in restaurants, and banning smoking in public places. So some of the features that characterize the U.S. health policy or characterize U.S. health policy. One, it's fragmented, incremental, and piecemeal. So health policy is often fragmented for lack of coordination between federal, state, and local governments. Public making involves compromises against competing interests. So it is incremental and piecemeal. Incremental policy may add new benefits to existing programs, such as adding a prescription drug benefit to Medicare. Piecemeal policy may create small new programs, such as CHIP. Now it's also pluralistic and interest group politics. So that's one of its features. So power interest groups lobby Congress to protect their own best interests. So for example, the AMA aims to protect the interests of physicians and the AARP lobbies on behalf of senior citizens. The next one is the decentralized role of the state. So health policy in the US is not con concentrated at the federal level. States have a significant role so examples include administration of Medicaid and CHIP programs, licensure of facilities and health professionals, certification oversight, and training of health professionals. Fragmentation of the system is exasperated with states having significant control over policies. Now, the impact of presidential leadership. The executive office is often looked to for strong leadership in health policy matters. And policy intervention begins with identifying what markets fail or do not function well. And there's one that I, it's not included here, and I think it's the following in the following slide, the government as a subsidiary to the private sector. So the private sector plays a dominant role. The government's role has increased incrementally in areas where the private sector has not been very effective. And that's where you see them jump in regarding um, the creation of Medicare and Medicaid. So let me see here. The government spending on health care fills the private sector groups. Okay, so there we go. That's the one that was missing. Um, so again, interventions such as these include environmental protection, preventative services, communicable disease control, care of special groups, institutional care of mentally and chronically ill, and medical care to the indigent, and support for research and training. All right, so for the next slide. Now, the government, again, as a subsidiary here, so most developed world view healthcare as a right that the government should play a leading role in. So that's where we come into the air, you know, touch on the subject of national healthcare programs as we learned in chapter one. Now, that general mistrust of government dates back to the founding of the nation. So an example on the Declaration of Independence illustrates great protests over government intrusion, intrusion on personal liberty. Also, the government's involvement in the U.S. health care is associated with the underprivileged. So the most cited problems that, were, that have been associated with government involvement in health care include bureaucratic inflexibility, excessive regulation, 
red tape, irrational paperwork, arbitrary and conflicting public directives, inconsistent enforcement of rules and regulations, um, escalating costs, fraud and abuse, inadequate reimbursement schedules, arbitrary um, denial of claims, insensitivity to local needs, consumer and pri provider dissatisfaction, government programs tend to promote welfare dependence rather than desire for employment. So these are the most cited problems associated with government involvement in healthcare. All right, so now I'm going to jump to slide number 20, discussing the centralized role of the state. So I know I briefly touched on it. Now the role, the role of the individual states has taken several forms, financial support for the, for the care and treatment of the poor and chronically disabled, and that's where we come, Medicare and Medicaid comes in, quality assurance and oversight of healthcare practitioners and facilities, regulation of healthcare costs and insurance carriers, health personal training, personnel training, sorry, and authorization of local government health services. So we have 24 state governments created that created actually an insurance risk pool. So this type of program or this insurance uh, called insurance risk pool helps people acquire private insurance otherwise unavailable to them because of the medical risks they pose to insurance companies. So the program was financed by a combination of individual premiums and taxes on insurance carriers. Now, I do want to um, point out that the Affordable Care Act did get rid of um, these need for state based, you know, the need for these state based risk pools under the assumption that insurance could insurers could not legally deny anyone with pre existing medical conditions, no matter how severe. So the state initiated programs were created to address again the needs of the vulnerable of vulnerable populations. Example of this, examples of this included in New Jersey, they developed a program to ensure access to care for all pregnant women. Florida set up a program called Healthy Kids Corporation, which linked health insurance to schools. And Washington developed a special program for the working poor that uses HMOs and preferred provider organizations or PPOs to provide care within the state's counties. We have Maine that established a program known as Maine Care to offer HMO based coverage at moderate prices to small businesses with 15 or fewer employees. And last listed here is Minnesota and they created a program known as the Children's Health Plan. And it was designed to provide benefits to children up to nine years of age who live in families with incomes below 185% of the federal poverty level, but who do not qualify for Medicaid. I do, I also want to include that there are two states that took bold policy initiatives to expand health insurance coverage. So we have Oregon in 1989, and this is in your textbook. Um, and they embarked on a controversial experiment that expanded Medicaid coverage to more than 100,000 additional people by reducing the Medicaid benefit package. And also Massachusetts, who passed a universal health insurance program that was based on employer and employee mandates. All right, so now for the impact of presidential leadership. Again, I touched on it very briefly. So a strong presidential role is necessary, and we've seen this with the passing of um, Medicare and Medicaid by uh, former President Lyndon B. Johnson, um, with George W. Bush, who added prescription drug coverage to Medicare, and also Harry Truman, who passed the Hilbert in Hospital Construction Act, which we covered earlier in this course. Now, the next slide touches on um, the bills that Richard Nixon, uh, former President Richard Nixon, 
passed. One included um, federal support of health maintenance organizations, excuse me, and that was in 1973. And then the enactment of the National Health Planning and Resources Development Act of 1974, that was the CON legislation, and effort. the effort was to restrain rising healthcare costs which we touched on in, if I'm not mistaken, chapter 12 when we were discussing um, cost in relation to healthcare. All right, so going to the next slide, now we're gonna be talking about the development of legislative uh, policy and the process that it goes through. So the making of a U.S policy, health policy is a complex process that involves private and public sectors. So first, um, the relationship of the government to the private sector. It reflects the distribution of authority and responsibility within a federal system of government. It reflects the relationship between policy formulation and implementation. It reflects a pluralistic ideology as the basis of politics and reflects the incre incrementalism as the strategy for reform. So the formation and implementation of health policy occurs in a policy cycle that has five components. First, we have issue raising, and that's really the enactment of a new policy that's generally preceded by a variety of actions that first create a widespread sense that a problem exists typically as a result of market failure that needs to be addressed. So in this case, example would be, you know, government as a subsidiary to the private sector. So the president may form uh, policy concepts from a variety of sources, and this is where the impact of the presidential influence comes in. We have policy design. And that's really where the presidents have substantial resources at their disposal for developing new policy proposals. And this is the, the area we touched on, on the impact of presidential influence. And organized interest groups attempt to increase their influence on policy design. So this is where interest, interest group politics comes in. Then third is public support building. And this is where presidents and key staff and departmental officials interact closely with the government. So we're looking at the balance of power. Legislators are the key suppliers of policies. Legislators play central roles in providing policies demanded by their various constituencies. And again, this touches on interest group politics. Then we have legislative decision making and policy support building. And this is where at least 14 committees and subcommittees in the House of Representatives and 24 in the Senate, along with over 60 other such legislative panels, have been identified as having some direct influence over the legislation. Then we have fifth, which is legislative decision-making and policy implementation. So once legislation has been signed into law, it is forwarded to the appropriate agency for implementation. The agency publishes proposed regulations in the federal register and then holds hearings regarding how the law is to be implemented. So a bureaucracy only loosely controlled by either the president or Congress writes regulations. So this include publishes, gathers, comments about, and rewrites, so it's a long process. Then the program goes on to the 50 states for enabling legislation, if appropriate. So there, there organized interests hire local lawyers and lobbyists, and a whole new political cycle begins. Finally, all parties adjourn to the courts where long rounds of litigation shape the final outcome. This complex process of policy development ensures that most policies are fragmented, incremental, and piecemeal, temporarily balancing the pluralistic interests 
So these activities are likely to be shared with Congress and interest groups in varying degrees, as you've just seen. We've went through all five and I described each for you. All right, so in the next slide, we are going to be talking about legislative committees and subcommittees. So Congress has three important powers that make it extremely influential in the health policy process. So the power to make all laws, which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution, and the power to tax and the power to spend. Now, I do want to briefly touch on this, which I know most of you probably, um, when I'm talking about suppliers of policy, know who I'm speaking of. But when we're talking about Congress, we're looking at this legislative branch of senators and congressmen, right? So they're often the key suppliers of policy because of these three constitutional powers, okay, that Congress has. Then we also have the executive branch. So when we're talking about the executive branch, this includes presidents, state governors, executives of departments and agencies. And third would be the judicial branch. And these are the courts that provide interpretation of statutes and establish um, judicial precedents. okay? Now next, um, I want to touch on the different committees. So there are the most influential committees in the House, which I'm going to go to the next slide to show you. And the Ways and Means Committee actually deals with tax issues, and they also hold jurisdiction over Medicare Part A, Social Security, Public Welfare, and Health Care Reform. Then we have the Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction over Medicare Part B, Medicaid, public health, mental health, health personnel, managed care, food and drugs, air population, product safety, and biomedical research. And in the next slide, we touch, we were covering Committee on appropriate, uh, Appropriations. So they're responsible for allocation of funds. Okay, so they're responsible for allocating and distributing federal funds for individual health programs. Now for the Senate. Now there are two most influential committees in the Senate. The first one is the Committee on Labor and Human Resources and their jurisdiction is over most health bills. And we also have the Committee on Finance, which has the jurisdiction over taxes and revenues. Now, in the next slide, I am gonna speak about this legislative process of how we take a bill and turn it into a law. In a little more detail with this diagram, I want you to get confused. As you can see, here is the stages through the Senate, as well as the House of Representatives. So we start with the House. And um, a bill is introduced in the House of Representatives, okay? The bill is assigned to the appropriate committees that we just listed, those most influential ones. And it's assigned to a subcommittee as well, which is forwarded to affected agency hearings and testimonies that are they are the bill is amended if needed and a decision to recommend or not recommend or table the bill so the, this is what's going on when it's assigned first to the committee then to a subcommittee then if it's recommended that bill is presented to the full house where it may be amended if approved the bill is forwarded to the Senate. Now, I know in the textbook, they also go through this as well. Now, the bill goes through the appropriate committee and subcommittee and goes through similar procedures as it did through the House. All right, so we started with the House, jumping over to the Senate. If recommended, the bill is presented to the full Senate where it may be amended. Changes require the bill to go back to the House for a vote. Controversial changes may trigger a review by a conference committee. 
And this conference committee includes committee members from the House and the Senate. Okay. After the bill has been passed by the House and the Senate in an identical form, it is sent to the president for a signature. And if the president signs the bill, it officially becomes a law. I hope I didn't confuse you guys with that because I know there was a number of stages and um, it can get a little confusing. But just to keep in mind, this kind of gives you an idea of the stages or the legislative process of taking a, you know, going from a bill that's introduced in the House of Representatives all the way through to if it's um, passed and from both the House and the Senate and in an identical form leading to that last stage of when the president signs it and it becomes a law. All right. All right, so now I'm going to jump to slide number 33. Oh no, sorry, it's actually gonna be further. Um, I'm actually gonna jump to access to care, which is slide number 34. And I wanna touch on the topics of, I wanna touch on the topics of critical policy issues that are related to access to care, cost of care, and quality of care, since those were the three main areas of healthcare that we touched on in chapter 12. All right, so let me go to slide 34. And this will be the last um, area in the, in the chapter, topic in the chapter that I'll be covering. Remember, that doesn't mean that you only go over what I address in these lectures. I expect you to go through all the slides and read the full chapter. Most of my slides are pretty self-explanatory and they coincide with the chapter that's being covered. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, so let me jump to access to care. So I want to touch on those critical policy issues that are related to access to care, which regarding access to care, such policies are aimed primarily at providers and payment mechanisms with the purpose of expanding care to the most needy and underserved populations, including the elderly, minorities, rural residents, those of low income, and persons with AIDS. Okay. And I touch on um, access to the elderly and minorities later on. I think it's slides 36 and 37. Now, regarding cost, cost of care, um, there's really no aspect of healthcare policy that has received more attention during the last 20 years than efforts to contain increasing healthcare costs. And you saw, um, how much this topic was emphasized in uh, the chapter, you know, covering cost, um, access, and quality. Now, so two major policy initiatives that were enacted by the federal government have targeted first hospital services and then physician services for price control. And the last uh, topic I want to talk about, which Again, there's more slides later in this presentation on the quality of care. Now, the quality of care becomes increasingly important in the face of managed care and concerns about the implications of doing less. Funding to evaluate new treatment methods and diagnostic tools is increasing dramatically. Funding for research to measure the outcome of medical interventions has also increased. So it is critical to evaluate quality in the light of both cost and access, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna jump back to the information from the chapter page from this week's module. Make sure we've covered everything. And again, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to let me know. So let me jump back there. All right, so let me scroll down. Forms of health policy, we covered uses of health policy two main types. We also, um, we covered everything on this page and more. 
If you have any questions, again, from this presentation, from chapter 13, do not hesitate to email me. You can also text me at the number found in the syllabus. Just make sure to include the course number and your name so I know who you are. And uh, take care and good luck, everyone. All right. Bye.